Bonju Habari Saleo. My name is Daniel Adeni, a professional officer at Ekle Africa. My name is Sinetem Bamtetwa, an intern at Ekle Africa. My name is Paul Curry, manager of the Urban Systems Unit at Ekle Africa. On behalf of Ekle Africa, the African Centre for Cities, Our Future Cities and Partners, I'm excited to welcome all of you to the Rise Africa 2021 Action Festival. Rise Africa has been growing as a platform of thinkers, doers and enablers, committed to inspiring action for sustainable cities. Rise Africa is about building active networks across academia, government, private sector, civil society and the arts. Our entry point is not based on articulating problems followed by proposing solutions, but rather on celebrating our cities as places of innovation and culture, while asking what more can we do to make them sustainable, inclusive and vibrant. This festival is hosting 46 sessions from across 16 countries in Africa and the world. Every session aims to share new ideas, showcase ongoing actions and launch new initiatives by bringing participants together to chart a new route forward. We hope that the festival program will inspire you to commit to one of more specific actions that you or your organization will take on. As this session closes, you will be redirected to a survey in which you can articulate these actions. We will follow up on these committed actions throughout the year and offer resources, connections and support. In this way, we are testing the idea that events can galvanize actions and we hope that you will join us in this effort. Beyond the session, there are many ways to take part in the festival. Register for further sessions. Vote for your favorite in the photo competition. Watch a variety of inspiring video provocations. Test your knowledge of African cities from our daily quiz. And listen and dance to the Rise Africa 2021 playlist. We hope that you will make all the attempts to reach out to new people and build long-lasting connections. Before we begin, it is important to note that this session is being recorded and that by participating, you are consenting to be recorded. All the recordings will be available on the program page after the festival. And may I say that creative expression is vital for creating new features for our cities. So we invite you to enter this session in the spirit of creativity and dreaming. Thank you very much. One, when people ask me where I'm from, I tell them I am from red dirt and green hills Endless mango trees whose small sun of a fruit is always within arm's reach. Smells so sweet your stomach speaks in small roars of impatience as you sip your cup of chai waiting for meals to finish cooking. I am from the sounds of my people. Language is so rhythmic you think we spoke in song. The melodies of matatu conductors waving on crowded city streets and the crow of roosters calling the sun from behind the horizon in the village. Two, when people ask me where I am from, I tell them, I am from a country mispronounced into modernity by wandering white men, from big men with small minds who stole the spoils of our struggles with no shame or foresight. I tell them I come from those who resisted, those whose dreams defied their bullets even after their breath was stolen from their bodies. Three, when people ask me where it is I'm from, I tell them I am from a new story about this country, this continent, this world, a new tale told by new authors, unafraid to wield the pen as a small spear, our ancestors as shield, our history as armor, as we use our words to help write this world anew. Creativity, welcome to the forecast best financing session. Thank you, everyone. Oh, that was an awesome poem. I have tried to be creative, but my creativity is still growing, so I will not be able to play for you this wonderful guitar from Malawi. Anyhow, I am Eddie Jemba, and I work for the Red Cross and Red Crescent Climate Center as an urban residence advisor, and I'll be uh, the convener for this particular session. And with me, I have uh, Irene Amuron, who will be introducing herself, and she will be also co-facilitating. Hi, Irene, can you please say hello? Hi, Eddie, hello, everybody, glad to be here. Thank you, thank you very much, Irene. And 
Uh, our participants, uh, you are most welcome and we would like to invite you to introduce yourselves. I see we are just nine here and I think many more may join us later on. Um, please feel free to unmute. Since we are nine, we have an opportunity to feel free to unmute and say who you are and uh, yeah, uh, maybe your work also. Thank you. I can go first while Thank I wait you. for my colleagues to join. So hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're dining in from. My name is Irene Amoron, and I lead the anticipatory action team with uh, the Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Center. And I'm happy to join the, the team today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene. Next. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Eddie. Hi, Irene. I'm Dorothy. I'm a technical advisor in the anticipatory action team at the Red Cross Red Cross and Climate Center, uh, working a lot on SDS and uh, on urban SDS in particular with Eddie. So really looking forward to this and it's nice to meet you all. Thank you very much and welcome. All right, uh, two minutes left for those ones who are really inspired. Otherwise, you can also feel free to uh, introduce yourself in the chat. I'll introduce myself here. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zach White, diving in from London. Uh, I'm with the GSMA's Mobile for Development Foundation. The, the GSMA is the global industry body for the telecommunications industry, and the Mobile for Development Foundation, predominantly funded by FCDO, supports startups and innovators who are using technology uh, to work across all of the SDGs, but I focus on water and sanitation. I'm joining to listen in because I have a particular interest with where technology and finance meet one another. Thanks, Zach. Uh, it was a little bit hard to hear you, but at least I heard that uh, you work in technology and you would like to bring that with financing. Please feel free to also add your introduction in a chat so that uh so that we can uh, be able to you know to to grasp uh who you are and what you're working on well okay um any other uh any other who is inspired to uh, good afternoon can i can i introduce myself please thank you uh my name is roldo kruger um, I'm from an organization called uh, Green Cape Sector Development Agency, uh, based in Cape Town. Um, and uh, what we do is we, um, our goal is to grow and establish the green economy um, in the Western Cape and South Africa. Um, by, and we do this through various mechanisms, um, but one of these is to unblock the, the barriers that uh, prevent the, the large scale uptake of um, close to market ready um, green and clean technologies. Um, and of course, we all know that um, one of those barriers or you know, the barriers that often come up um, related to this is finance um, and funding. So very interested to, to hear what the session is about. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, uh, nice to meet you, Raldo. All right. Um, thank you also, Megan, for introducing yourself uh, in the chat. Um, I will invite all the rest to do the same. Now, this is about forecast and forecast-based financing. Now, forecasting in related to uh, weather and extreme weather events, so in the climate sense. I would like us to play a very quick game about forecasting. And if you join me, it would be even much better if we played it with videos. But I also understand that sometimes it's not possible. So if it's not possible, we will use the icon. There is that icon, the thumbs up icon. There is that one which is usually used for, uh, you know, blowing and celebration, but we will imagine that that is a bucket. 
Now I'm looking for an umbrella, but I can see that there are four, uh, there are four, we will, we will, no, I can't, I can't see the umbrella. Okay, uh, these, we'll use the club in one of the, but follow with me very quickly. Uh, let me share my screen. Trying out forecast best game. Okay, I'm gonna share that one. It might be confusing, but I hopefully not so much. So, mission finance, climate innovation, uh, decision for the seasons. That's the name of the game. It might lead some bit of confusion, but I think I'll try to simplify it as much as possible. There will be winners and losers, hopefully not. But the idea is to have as to protect your development gain in a city. Um, um, assume you know you have been able to uh, develop uh, your city, and uh, but then we are living in a world of climate change, and therefore extreme weather events pose a risk to us. Okay. So we are going to be rolling a die. I'll be rolling a die. Now, this particular die will be representing the historical amount of rainfall that you have received in a city. And therefore, it will be, you will try to anticipate what kind of um, season is coming ahead of you. If you think the season will be good, then you will, you will uh, uh, invest your resources accordingly. Now, this used to be a physical game that we were playing with people, but in this case, it's going to be virtual. So you imagine you have 10 development points already uh, for your city, wonderful roads, you have all the wonderful buildings, and you have made some investment in resilience, okay? So, but now for the next season, we'll be rolling a die to predict what's coming in the next season. If you see a one, that means that, oh, that's not very much rain, so it's a drought. If you see a six, and uh, that means it is uh, a flood, okay? Anything in between is a good year, all right? Um, we will just roll for 10 times, and then we'll see if for all the 10 times, your predictions were good, and then your investments were on point. Okay. Um, yep. Each city decides how to invest. You see the thumbs up. You means you're expecting a good year, and there are four. But if you are expecting a the, a bad year and you're expecting a drought, you you invest in a, in drought insurance. If you're expecting uh, a flood, you invest in flood insurance. So if the die shows six and you have flood insurance, you are good, no destruction. If the die shows a, a one and you do not have a drought insurance, bad idea, you lose some development points. Okay, now, uh, Eddie, a, a moment. Could we just uh, confirm that the drought will be represent the bucket will be represented by the cone, the celebratory cone, and yes. the umbrella will be rep uh, represented by the club, right? For those who may not be able to turn on the videos. Thank you very much, Irene. Yes, for those who are not able to turn on the videos, you'll indicate your choice. If you are expecting a drought, and you want to invest in drought insurance then it will be, a, what, what is that, Irene, that you call it? Celebratory corn. Celebratory corn. Just click on it. I can't see now because I'm sharing the screen. Um, and then we say, if, if you are investing in a, a flood insurance, then you just uh, show the hand clap, okay? 
All right, uh, and uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but let's, uh, I would like us to try it out for five minutes and then we go into in-depth discussion about the forecast-based financing. This particular game is just to help us see how decision, decisions are made uh, in light of forecasts. All right? Okay. Ready? Yes. Okay. Since you are ready, I'm going, I will stop playing this, uh, showing that, and I'm going to roll a die. Remember, uh, if you're expecting a good year, you just do that. If you are expecting a drought, you do that. And if you are expecting a flood, this is really not uh, yeah, that. Okay. Now I am sharing a screen for to run the die. Ah, uh, well, good job, good job, good job. My die. There you go. There you go. So I am about to roll a die. Tell you and now before I roll a die, you indicate your choice. What are you expecting? Is it a flood? Is it a flood? Is it uh, a good year? Is it a drought? And there you go. Uh, I don't know which choice that you made, but was it a good year? Was it a corn representing the drought? Or was it a club representing uh, a flood? Well, we had a good year. I am rolling once more. There you go. What do we see? We see uh, who got it. Uh huh. There was a flood, and I can see that Lauren and uh, who's that? Have people changed their choices? And Irene. Okay. All right. Well, I'm a quick one. I'll roll once more, and then I'll move on. Okay. Share the screen. Uh huh. Yeah. Your choice. How was it? How was it? Salome and Dorothy expected a drought, and they invested in drought in drought resilience. Well done. The rest, I don't know what happened to you, but um, remember this climate change, and with climate change. Uh, comes extreme weather events, and that means the intensity also of the of the extreme weather events changes and the frequency. Therefore, we are going to have a change of the die. Instead of a four-sided die, we have an eight-sided die. Now, anything seven and above, that's a flood. Anything Two and below, that's going to be a drought. Can you make your choices? Uh -huh. I hope that you've made your choices. I'm going to roll a die. Rolling once. Done. Good year. Bad year. Rolling twice. Decisions. And rolling the final time. Pop. Stop sharing and see. Ah. Uh, all right, I hope you got it right. Um, that was just to test, to tease you a bit about uh, working with forecasts when we are making an investment. Now, this game can be well elaborated, can be an elaborated one, and uh, but we don't, in the interest of time, we cut it short right there. What is forecast-based financing? What is it? And uh, that's where I would like to invite you to listen uh, to, uh, to watch this particular video that I'm going to share and then to listen to the subsequent presentation, which will elaborate what is forecast-based financing. Uh, stay with me as I share. This. Mm -hmm. Okay. Reaction, not anticipation.
This is how disaster response works today. Cyclones, extreme snowfalls, floods. Every year, disasters cause thousands of deaths and destroy livelihoods all over the world. Until now, people only received help after a disaster had already taken its toll. This is what we want to change with forecast-based financing. Using forecast models and satellite data, experts can predict the probability of extreme weather events with increasing accuracy. Forecast-based financing uses scientifically determined early warning indicators to decide when, where and how resources are mobilised and funds are released, so that early actions can be taken to reduce harm. This approach links a network of scientists and our profound know-how in disaster response to reduce risks and enhance preparedness before a disaster occurs. For example, once a forecast reaches a high threshold of probability that a cyclone will hit the coast, resources are distributed automatically so that predefined early actions can be taken to protect the population. Emergency shelters will be set up, medical kits, food and clean water provided, and people evacuated. By anticipating rather than reacting, we will save the lives and livelihoods of the most vulnerable people. This mechanism for forecast-based action is integrated into our Disaster Relief Emergency Fund, short DREF, supported by governments, institutional and private donors. The Red Cross Red Crescent movement is the pioneer in disaster response worldwide. With forecast-based financing, we continue along this path, united in a mission of saving lives, promoting dignity and leaving no one behind. To learn more, visit forecastbasedfinancing.org. Thank you very much. Thank you. For those who have just joined us, uh, please feel free to introduce yourselves down there. Um, and I can see that some questions have already started emerging. Uh, thank you very much for sharing those questions. Uh, we will be answering them. And right now, allow me um, to invite, allow me to invite Irene, uh, who is also a very seasoned uh, forecast-based financing, also forecast-based action, sometimes we call it, expert, uh, to explain to us how in detail in uh, how is the setup what is it irene the floor is yours thank you, thank you so much uh, eddie and a pleasure to uh, share with you some of uh, the examples and the insights on how we are doing focus based financing within the red cross movement so i will quickly share my presentation okay there we go all right, without uh, further ado, uh, we'll just start off the presentation and uh, I will provide a quick background uh, on where we are coming from with uh, this approach of focus based financing. And uh, if, you, if you've been following the trends of, uh, on, on, on climate and the impact that it has on people, we are saying that this has increased. And uh, some of the figures that we are having here were extracted from the World Disaster Report of 2020 that was published by uh, the International Federation of the Red Cross last year. And uh, what is staggering is when you look at the percentages, it's telling us that 83 of all disasters triggered by natural hazards were actually caused by extreme weather and climate related events such as flood storms and heat waves. And I can also believe uh, most of us in one way or another have experienced or read about the impacts of this weather related events and also last year even during a pandemic we clearly saw how weather and climate related events um, quickly uh, you know uh, the, the impact was quietly felt across uh, across the world and then also based on the same report we are seeing that the number of climate and weather related events has been increasing since the nine uh, since the 1960s almost rising by 35 uh, percent 
And then, of course, uh, the impacts of uh, climate uh, uh, weather related, uh, uh, the impacts from climate and weather related events have been clearly documented. And again, based on the same report, we are seeing 83% of all disasters were caused by extreme weather and climate related events. And we had over 400,000 people that were reported uh, dead uh, uh, as a result of these uh, events. We are increasingly seeing that the number of these events will increase, the impact will increase, the frequency of these events will increase, you know, and with them will be a negative impacts. We are going to see more rising temperatures. And of course, I think this is also one of the main issues that people in the cities uh, are grappling with. We are going to see the negative impacts on the ecosystem, arising the sea level and the storm surges, uh, changing the rainfall patterns, and then, of course, uh, we are going to see an amplification of the veracity of these extreme events, uh, increase, including also its unpredictability and definitely having a very great negative impact on the most uh, vulnerable people. Research, research has also shown that if we sit back and do nothing, we will have over 200 million people needing humanitarian aid by two, uh, 2050 if we do not do something right now to be able to address uh, the impacts of uh, climate change or more still to be able to you know, uh, 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 curb these, uh, these impacts. If we sit back and withhold, uh, uh, you know, if we sit back and do nothing, the number of people who are going to need humanitarian aid will increase. And then also the cost of humanitarian response will be quite higher. So that is a big challenge for us. And this, uh, <clears throat> this report, if you're interested in reading it, uh, you can still access it on the I4C website. It's called, it's called the cost of doing nothing. So it challenges us that if we continue doing things the way we are, then by 2050, we are going to have 200 million people needing aid. And also more money will be needed to be able to address those, those needs. So with such a, a, a glaring picture, and also in, in, in addition to what already we know in regards to the impact of climate change, there is a call for action and there is something that we can do. And for us as the Red Cross, one of the approaches towards addressing the impacts of these uh, climate uh, events is taking the anticipatory action. And uh, within that, we are looking at focus-based financing. So what do we mean by focus-based financing? Importantly, we are looking at a mechanism that enables access to funding for early action based on a credible forecast and an in-depth risk analysis. So what does that mean? That we do have money to be able to implement early actions. We do have the triggers that would tell us when and where do we take uh, early actions. And of course, we've identified and selected these early actions in advance. Again, within the Red Cross movement, we do have a financing mechanism that is called uh, focus-based financing, uh, focus-based action by the DREF. So this financing uh, mechanism is only eligible to the Red Cross national societies uh, after they have developed an early actions protocol, which is a document that clearly indicates what action will be taken when, as well as the roles and responsibilities of the various stakeholders. So this financing mechanism and our national societies will have access to around 350,000 CHF. However, other organizations also do have their anticipatory financing mechanism. The UN has the SAF. Uh, that they are using to, uh, to be able to uh, fund anticipatory action. We do have the start network that has the start fund. And I guess other organizations also do have their type of uh, uh, funding. So for the people uh, who work in the cities, uh, it is also a challenge to us in terms of what financing mechanisms could be availed to be able to take early actions in, this, um, uh, in, 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 in the cities, in the urban, in the urban settings. So, under focus-based financing, we are looking at three main components, which I'll talk about in, uh, in detail briefly. So we are looking at the triggers that are usually developed based on uh, analysis of focus. We are looking at uh, early actions that are agreed in advance. We do not begin discussing what early actions to take when the focus has already uh, uh, come through. These actions as, uh, are identified and selected in advance. And then of course the financing mechanism that I have just uh, talked about. And basically uh, the aim of focus-based financing is we would like to reduce the human suffering that comes as a result of these uh, negative uh, impacts of climate and weather related events, particularly by taking advantage of the window of opportunity 
between the alert, the time that an event has been forecasted uh, to, to cause negative impacts and its occurrence. So that window period is what we want to take advantage by implementing early actions. And of course, we've dedicated ring, fund, uh, ring fence funding to enable implementation of these early actions. So for us to be able to define the triggers, triggers meaning at what point do we take action, we use the impact-based forecasting uh, model. So basically, this is uh, a, a, an approach that looks at what is the weather, what is the impact of the weather. So a transition from what the weather will be to actually what impact is this weather event going to bring? When will this? When is this impact expected? Where will it happen? And how likely uh, are these impacts uh, to to occur? And then through this process, uh, the impact-based forecasting model, we are also able to have an idea in terms of. Uh, in terms of the people or the assets to be affected, and ultimately also uh, what the impacts of this will be, and then also uh, what are the actions are we able to take to be able to address uh, this impact. If you'd like to read more about um, uh, the, the impact-based forecasting process uh, that the Red Cross uses, then feel uh, we will share with you this uh, presentation. You're able to, to access these documentations, and this document will clearly tell you how we are doing it and with whom uh, we are doing it. And I also what I need to mention under the impact-based forecasting model is that this has to be a very strongly collaborative process. So you will see that uh, the Red Cross works has to work in close collaboration with national hydromet uh, agencies. We have to work with the cities. We have to work with the universities or academia. We have to work with government agencies and all the other stakeholders. This is all to ensure that you know we are all having the expertise that is needed to be able to agree on the triggers or the thresholds, basically at what point and when do we take early actions, what kind of early actions do we take, and then of course discussing also the financing that is needed for these uh, actions to be implemented. Again, the approach that we are, we are using in terms of setting up the forecast-based financing uh, system uh, this is what we propose uh, within uh, with, with, within the uh, within the Red Cross uh, movement. So our starting point is the risk analysis or the risk assessments. Important to know that this is not a linear process, but we do have our starting point as our risk analysis. So basically, through the risk analysis, it helps to tell us what are the impacts that occur in a particular area or the impacts of concern. So if we are talking about, um, um, I'll give an example, if you're talking about Kampala, for example, based on, um, uh, based on historical analysis, based on uh, 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 consultations with uh, various stakeholders, including communities, we are able, for example, to say that flash flooding is a problem in Kampala. So if it is a problem, what are its impacts? You know, uh, it causes, uh, uh, it destroys the road infrastructure, it destroys shelter, especially for people living in slums, uh, there is water contamination. So in the risk analysis, we are able to identify the impacts of the hazard of interest. We are able to identify who is affected, where are they located, and also understand their vulnerabilities. What makes them vulnerable to the impacts, for example, of flash floods? What makes them uh, more exposed to the impacts of uh, flash floods? Is it that you know they are poor enough that they can't afford living in affluent areas? Is it that they do not have knowledge and that's why they are settling in places where they should not be? So this risk analysis process is usually conducted through a, a robust literature review, as well as uh, conducting uh, consultations with, uh, with people. Uh, what, how this process is done is that most countries that are setting up focus-based financing have set up what we call technical working group that have uh, representatives of uh, the partners I talked about, the National Hydromet Agencies, the Red Cross, the UN, uh, NGOs, academia, and all any other relevant stakeholders. Then the second uh, uh, step would be, uh, I will combine step two and step three. So step two and step three, uh, the end uh, output in these two steps is we want to define uh, the trigger. Trigger meaning we want to know at what point do we take uh, action. So for us to be able to do this process, we need to understand what focus are available in country. 
Okay, so we conduct uh, an analysis and develop what we call a menu of focus. Basically, this menu of focus gives you an idea of the focus that are available in a country. Again, I'll use Uganda as an example. So based on the analysis that was done for the focus for floods in Uganda, uh, we, we confirmed that, of course, there are the, the, the seasonal uh, forecasts are provided. There is the 10-day forecast that is provided. There is the daily forecast that, uh, that is pro, uh, provided. So when we understand the focus, Focus that are available. The second question would be, how good enough are these focus to enable us to take action within a certain period? So again, for Uganda, uh, based on our analysis, uh, we realize that Uganda as a country does not have a flood forecasting model. So in that absence, we are using the global model, which is the, the, the um, uh, uh, the, the GLOFAS, the Global Flood Forecasting Awareness System, to be able to uh, give us an indication within a seven, uh, within a five day lead time, in, 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 in with a 70 probability that flooding is going to occur in certain uh, in certain places. And again, this process, like I said, is, is, is done collaboratively with the relevant stakeholders. So when you're looking at step two and step three, you're looking at, so for example, if you're looking at flooding, at what point does a certain amount of water become a problem in a certain location? So again, this analysis is done by looking at the historical data, by doing some statistical modeling. So this is where you're going to need, uh, you know, climate scientists to be able to help you with this kind of uh, uh, questions. And ultimately, then we come up with a trigger. So uh, for the case of Uganda, the Uganda Red Cross have developed their early actions protocol. And their trigger is that they will activate their early actions if GLOFAS indicates that there is a 70% probability of flooding occurring in a certain number of high risk uh, uh, districts for floods and uh, within a five day uh, lead time, then they are able to activate their early actions. Then the process of selecting early actions. This is again also another quite intense um, process where through the technical working groups, uh, we reflect on what early actions have been taken in the past in anticipation of a flood in this case. What has been the effectiveness of this early action? So we also look at the, the literature uh, evidence that is available to be able to enable us uh, eventually decide and say this early action is able to reduce the impact that we are looking at. A classic example is that uh, we've identified that uh, the provision of water purification tablets uh, 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 helps to reduce um, uh, contamination of, uh, of, 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 of water as a result of, uh, that comes as a result of flooding. So Uganda Red Cross, based on the literature, based on their expertise and based on, based on uh, uh, discussing with other stakeholders, identified the provision of water uh, purification tablets as one, of the, as, as, as one of the early actions that they will do to be able to ensure that people still have access to safe and clean water in anticipation for, uh, for a flood. And then of course, there is a prioritization process. So we usually come up with a long list of early actions. But then based on capacities, based on resources, the feasibility to implement these early actions within a certain period of time, uh, there is a whole lot of a criteria that we follow when we are selecting these early actions. And then we come up with a very short list of these are the early actions that we are going to implement. And then final, no, uh, the next step is that we put all this within the framework of an early actions protocol. So I mentioned again, this is a document within the Red Cross movement that clearly stipulates what triggers have been identified, what impacts uh, 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 does the organization or stakeholders want to address, what activities or early actions have been implemented, who is going to do what, what role, how is the coordination with the different stakeholders, and then of course how, uh, uh, the funding that will be needed to, to implement this. Other organizations like the UN have what they call anticipatory action framework. For us, the Red Cross, we call uh, we do have what we call uh, the early actions protocol, but it's similar. It's, it's a similar doc document, different names, but the purpose is, uh, is the same. So once this is developed, it is presented to uh, stakeholders again in country to be able to review it and validate it. And uh, once that is done, the National Society then sends it to IFRC uh, for uh, review, validation, and approval upon which they'll be eligible for the funding that I had mentioned earlier, the FBA by, by the draft. So when we are done with that uh, process uh, six, 
there is a continuous process that goes on in terms of monitoring the focus to ensure that either we have reached uh, the thresholds or not. And this uh, in the various uh, countries where we are implementing focus-based financing, uh, in collaboration with the National Hydromet, uh, a dashboard has been uh, developed. So different people have access to this dashboard. And then once, for example, uh, the threshold has been reached, you do receive an automatic email uh, uh, informing you that your threshold has been uh, reached. Therefore, you can activate uh, your, uh, your EAP. So this is how the FBF system is being is, is set up within, uh, within the Red Cross. Again, this is not a linear process. It's quite an iterative process, and this is a continuous process. Even when an EAP has been developed, that does not mean that you know, the process is done. There is continuous updating of this EAP as and when you know, a new information or new initiatives come up. So for example, for the Uganda uh, case, the government of Uganda is working, on, uh, is working on developing a national flood uh, forecasting model. So once that is done, we will see how can that help us make our decisions vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the models that we are already using. And definitely uh, this may call for a review of uh, the early actions protocol. Um, this map here indicates to you, um, gives you a geographical presentation of where different organizations are implementing anticipatory early action. Within the Red Cross, again, this is happening in 29 countries, but collaboratively with the UN, uh, UN OCHA, WFP, uh, FAO, uh, the State Work, and uh, the Red Cross col collectively, there are over 60 countries that are implementing uh, focus-based financing for different hazards, as you can see within, uh, within the map. And I'd like to end that, uh, we do have what we call the anticipation hub. So this is like our one-stop shop center for all your information needs in regards to what is going on and who is doing what uh, in the anticipatory action space. So this uh, platform brings together practitioners, policy makers, scientists, government representatives for us to advance the, ad the agenda on anticipatory action. Uh, that is what I had for you today. I'm happy to respond to any questions uh, that uh, the colleagues may have. Thank you, Eddie, and over to you. Thank you very much, Irene. Um, that was <clears throat> a rich presentation with the mechanism of forecast-based financing. I'm sure uh, some of our participants already are uh, inspired to ask some questions based on what you um, have presented. I. I will, <clears throat> I will give them an opportunity. Now, I would like to invite you, all our participants, what questions do you have? What is it um, that the presentation triggered in your mind? Is this what you expected? I'm sure you have some questions. And um, um, Irene, uh, there was a question earlier on and uh, about how do we, I'm trying to get it, but it was about how do we even trust the forecast or um, scoring? How, how do we really have control when predicting the weather? <laughs> okay, uh, that, uh, this question would be best answered from uh, by a climate scientist who is not, uh, <laughs> who Present. is not, yeah, who is not present in, uh, in, 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 in the group. But I also want to mention that I know there are some attempts as part of uh, the geoengineering uh, agenda to be able to manipulate the weather for us to have kind of control uh, over it. So there is that one aspect. Um, I am afraid I cannot answer that because yes, um, yes, over to you, Ed. No worries, uh, okay. Uh, I will attempt a little bit to say that well, um, what is really done is actually through uh, computer-based models, like uh, which model, how the wind will move, how the moisture will go, and uh, where. So that's how the prediction is made, but it's a little bit complex uh, for, for this and also uh, to be explained on this, but it is possible, um, although with varying degrees of um, of accuracy. Uh, nonetheless, there is, I think, so far we have learned that there is a benefit in um, using weather or hydromet forecasts 
uh, to, to implement early actions. And while we were talking, Irene, we were also joined by uh, uh, Kobe. Uh, Kobe, you are welcome. Um, all right. Questions still, and also Rashik from our future cities here in Cape Town. You are welcome. Thank you for joining. So Irene has presented, and we are now looking forward to your questions. Irene, I, I, I see I was typing a question which I didn't complete. I will send it for the benefit of the participants. I understand that up to date, uh, most of the forecast-based financing uh, approaches um, have been uh, funded through humanitarian uh, agencies. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering how cities can leverage this approach. Or oh, have you even heard of opportunities where cities can tap on the portion of funding that has been channeled to the humanitarian agencies to implement early actions. Ah. Hey, uh, I, I think increasingly we are having funding for anticipatory action or focus-based financing going beyond uh, the usual suspects of the humanitarian funders. So for example, the project, the focus-based financing project being implemented in East Africa is actually funded by the IKEA Foundation. And you know, we are having uh, an, an interest from private companies being interested in terms of how can they contribute towards this climate uh, change adaptation agenda. We are having uh, universities, for example, uh, being interest, increasingly interested in terms of how can we uh, uh, contribute towards anticipatory action from a research uh, uh, angle. So I, I, I want to believe the awareness is, is broadly growing. Most of actually the funders of, uh, most of the funders to the to to, to the to the to, to the FBF are actually governments, but mainly, of course, from from Europe. So also a big challenge to us as uh, as Africans, you know, how can our governments be proactive enough to begin uh, ensuring that we have funding as and when it's needed to be able to mitigate these impacts of, of, of climate change. I do not have specific examples for funding for cities, but I think it is both an opportunity and a challenge for us to have this conversation with, with the city authorities. Over to you, Eddie. Thank you, thank you very much. And please, please feel free, type in your question, uh, even if it's a clarification about the approach itself, uh, about examples of where it, the approach has been successfully implemented. Please type your questions. I had, I envisioned this as a more interactive uh, uh, session rather than <clears throat> a one way. So mm, later on, uh, Rashik, what would you say is the best case study in an urban area where focus based financing was used? What were the key lessons? You know what? That's a nice question. I'm looking through our. Okay, I was looking through our participants. One of them was part of an implementation in Asia, but I think they have jumped off. Um, okay, now. Uh, I will share the case study within a, within in a, in Asia in Hanoi. There is a case study that I will share, and perhaps I will give Irene an opportunity to first uh, respond to Shafiki's question, the second one right now, um, and then I will present the the case study from Hanoi, where it was typically represent, presented in a city. But I also know that back to my neighbors in Dai Salaam, they actually piloted forecast-based financing. And uh, uh, although it was still funded by the World Bank, uh, brought together the Red Cross family, American Red Cross, Tanzania Red Cross, uh, the Red Cross Climate Center, and then the University of Adi uh, in Dai Salaam, uh, where the students are extensively mapped um, uh, 
three municipalities, uh, if I recall very well, uh, to identify the most the areas that are at m most at risk of flooding and then together with the Red Cross volunteers they were able to identify some actions that can be taken in um, in, 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 in that area. But Irene has to go for another session. Let me first allow her to, uh, uh, to respond to this second question and then I'll present the next case study. Thank you, Irene. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Eddie, and thanks, Shafiq, for your question. Uh, we do not have, uh, at, at this point, examples where we've had uh, permanent infrastructure being undertaken as part of uh, the FDF initiative, mainly because, yes, resources is one angle, but then also the practicality and the feasibility of the short time, the short lead times that we are working with. And usually, uh, these um, interventions are aimed at, you know, saving, saving lives. That is usually the most um, uh, the overarching uh, reason for, for for doing this. So with the limitation of time, with the limitation of resources, such heavy infrastructure is not feasible. And that's why you know we are saying focus-based financing should be embedded in the general disaster risk management cycle. It should not be looked at as standalone. We are only taking advantage of uh, the last mile, like what 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 I, would, I usually like calling FBF as acute DRR, you know, is just that last small phase of uh, DR uh, 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 DR preparedness before the event uh, event happens. So with such limitations, it's it, it's not feasible for such investments uh, or uh, activities to be implemented within such a short lead time. Thank you so much. I have to run for another session. All the best. And if you have any question, you're in capable hands of Eddie. Have a lovely session. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene. And uh, yeah, goodbye. Um, <clears throat> so just so to say, Irene and I work together. Dorothy also here on the call, actually. Yeah. Uh, Dorothy, please feel free also to jump in. Uh, Dorothy, uh, he's also my workmate, uh, based in another uh, part of the world, but she also works uh, very well on uh, the focus based financing uh, approach. First, let me take you back a little bit. It is like Irene called it acute DRR. That basically means that um, we are looking forward to making use of the window of opportunity after a forecast has been issued that there is going to be maybe heavy rains, maybe a cyclone is coming even maybe a drought is expected and then before the actual realization of the drought itself or um, the flood or whatever hazard that we are talking about um, it was designed to save lives in a moment or in that short window of of opportunity that is available um, but we also believe that it it is very critical um, when you are thinking about the big um, the big adaptation ecosystem, if I can use that, uh, because it would save us uh, on losing the development gains that we have invested in for over a long a long time. Now, I can see Samantha's question. Dorothy, are you able to answer in part or in all Samantha's question? which says, can you tell us more about how decisions would be taken as to how much to fund for a forecast event? Sure, I can try it, Eddie. Hi, Samantha, thanks for your question. Um, and great to hear all these um, keen questions in the chat. It's, uh, it's super interesting to, to see the enthusiasm and, and uh, it's great. So to answer your question, Samantha, or to try to answer your question, um, I think what is normally done is organizations or, or in our case uh, red cross national societies have an idea already of how much um, certain actions would cost them to do um, within their yeah within their normal functioning so how much would an evacuation cost how much um, how much do water purification tablets cost etc and so there are these budgets that are set up in advance and the idea is that if you can set up this Kind of understanding of how much money you're going to need to support whatever early action you can do um, based on a weather forecast. Um, but then it becomes much easier then for you to access this money um, based on all the, the set of criteria. And so if you 
if you know about the budget and if you know how much you're going to need to to implement um, yeah to implement whatever whatever early actions you want you um, you can then have as you say this pool of, of funding already available which you can readily access so this is a bit the rationale behind forecast based financing and the question is now how can um, this be uh, be harnessed by by cities by municipal officials by um, yeah, by whoever, whatever actors uh, that exist in the complex urban space, and and figuring out stuff from uh, from that. I hope that somewhat answers your question, but please feel free to unmute and uh, and chat with us here. Yeah, thank you very much. And so the the the, the, the beauty in having a small uh, group is that you have an opportunity to uh, to speak out, Samantha, if you'd like. Yes, thank you, um, Eddie. Hello, and thank you, Dorothy. Um. So then, if I understand it, it relies in part on um, cities having some rather transparent costings of, in anticipation of saying, look, we can see from longer term forecasts that it might be necessary to do, to do the following things, and this is how much we would estimate we would need, um, so that it would be fairly transparent because. From my understanding, there is just a quite a, a strong uh, pressure on a funder side to want to know the justification for for spending. Um, so, if I understand correctly, these cities would need to have some kind of planning and preparation for roughly this is how much it would cost to do any given action. Is that right? So yes, to begin with, um, number one, we only have a few cities that have not even, I think maybe even one concrete example, which is Hanoi uh, in Vietnam, that has um, implemented the focus-based financing approach. Um, but the amount of funding has been, because these are Red Cross projects, so has been, did, uh, determined, uh, nice choice of word, as opposed to what I was about to say, has been determined by, uh, by, by the pool of money that is coming from uh, um, the big source. So the Red Cross has a one big source, and then they have uh, decided that because we have many countries that we want to support, therefore we will offer, I think Dorothy, you can correct me, is it 250,000 CHF? Um, to but renewable um, for a given um, national society, in this case, a given Red Cross. So money would come from Geneva to Kampala, uh, to Uganda Red Cross, or from Geneva to Nairobi, uh, to Kenya Red Cross. Um, that is how it is. Um, that is how it is. It is it, 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 it has been um, conceived. We have not had an opportunity where money of course, because the pool is still small coming through the humanitarian organizations where money is transferred from uh, the humanitarian fund to a city itself. So it is being channeled through uh, other NGOs. However, also the NGOs, in this case, uh, all the Red Cross National Society takes the responsibility to go on the ground and say, if we are to intervene uh, to help uh, to make sure that lives are saved and livelihoods for a thousand households in a city like Cape Town, a city like Kampala, we will need this much money. If the need goes beyond a hundred, uh, uh, one thousand households, then the money has to be made much more. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Eddie. That's a very useful um, description. Very interesting proposal and justification. Thank you. Thank you very much. However, we would like actually now <clears throat> also just to let you know that most of the focus based financing approach, also called the anticipatory action approach, has been implemented in the rural context. Now we are trying to bring it within the city and would like to know 
you know, what kind of questions do we need to ask ourselves before we, got, we go into the cities? Um, um, and also, um, what kind of opportunities are there? What kind of challenges are there? These are things that we expect to hear from the people who primarily work in the, in the, in the, in the city setting. And uh, I would be really, really, really um, excited to have, you know, to hear from you um, about such questions. Um, in, yeah, now again, the mic, I hand over the mic uh, for the next two minutes, next five minutes, then I'll present to you the case study uh, from Vietnam. What did they do and how? Which will answer Shafiki's question. Okay. Anyway, we still have the opportunity to to go th to answer questions after the Vietnam case study. So, if you allow me, let me quickly share my screen, and there you go, so that I can take you through this case study. It was prepared by Madame Tran Sifa, who is not here to present it, but let me see if I can do justice. So. Focus this actions for heat waves in the cities. Remember, it is based on uh, the impact based forecasting. First, you have to know what will the weather do, and then what kind of impacts will it bring about the negative impact, and what can you do to prevent it. In knowing what will the weather do, you have to identify who are the most vulnerable uh, to this particular weather that you are expecting. So for, for Vietnam, uh, it was, in, and particularly in Hanoi, um, it was, there was a risk analysis conducted and which brought these results. Working with uh, uh, health workers, we, they realized that 20 per, there was 20% increase in hospitalization and about 50, uh, 46 uh, respirator, respiratory disease increase. Um, when uh, certain the temperature has increased, uh, and of course they know it's also a fifteen percent increase in hospitalization for people with mental disorders. Um, who are the most vulnerable? Through research, uh, again, best desktop based research supplemented with interviews within the community, they noticed that it is the elderly, the children, and the outdoor workers who are most at risk of heat waves in the city. Um, and of course, that was uh, put together. What were they experiencing? Tiredness, heavy sweating, understanding that the heat, the heat wave does not often um, you know, like someone has said, the heat wave do not kill, but it is a silent killer. It is not, it is, it, it is um, experienced through other things. So like uh, the tiredness, like the heavy sweating, like being thirsty and, um, you know, the headaches and dizziness. So in, a, in, a, in, in Hanoi, uh, the research indicated that 65% um had more symptoms at least four of uh, uh um symptoms and then seven percent could cope uh by staying in an air conditioned place most of them didn't have access to air conditioners which i think is closely related to what happens in our cities and then 76 percent could not recognize the signs of heat related illnesses um some of the actions, uh, I don't want to take you through this entire thing, uh, but some of the actions that were identified were setting up cooling centers, especially for outdoor workers, and there was a fear of change around it. Important, in the, in the focus-based financing uh, actions or focus-based financing uh, approach, they, you have to set up, you have to set up a trigger and, uh, and say, when this particular threshold is reached, 
then I will release the money or I release the funding to implement early actions to prevent adverse impacts on uh, on 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 on, um, on people and maybe their livelihoods. For Hanoi, you'll see that the heat it was the heat index that was taken as a as a trigger and the relative humidity so wherever the heat reached around 46 um, degrees celsius and relative humidity uh, about of um, at about 95 percent then that will be the trigger for actions for releasing of finance funding and for action within the city and there has to be early time so you don't have to do it when you know you don't implement early actions when the, the 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 hazard has already reached but for the city of hanoi it is the six days lead time but also the three days so there are activities that are implemented six days to the heat wave and then other activities three days to the to the heat wave these are some of the activities that they conducted you know providing cooling centers uh, and also cooling buses. Within the cooling buses, um, they would provide some water, they would provide some wet towel, they would pro also provide some education about um, beating the heat or surviving the heat. When we talk about impact-based forecasting, you have to have an in-depth analysis of the vulnerability of the given area that you are targeting. Um, so who who is at risk and why? And then where are they located, the exposure part? And then the combination of, the, of those two would tell you where to take action. This is in part be inspired because of the limited financing. You cannot act everywhere, but then you want to target the most at risk. Um, yeah, this is what was happening in the early, in the cooling centers. Um, providing some water for outdoor workers, providing, but in addition, providing some education material, telling them uh, maybe to stay inside during the, the 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 hottest part of the day and then work later. So that means adjusting in the working schedule and also uh, maybe painting their houses when they go back home. Uh, a little bit of education supplemented with the immediate action. What were the results? So, of course, so many people, more than a thousand, were able to, uh, to visit the cooling centers, and then um, mostly were street vendors, but also bikers and then other casual laborers. There was a significant difference between the cooling center and the outside in terms of temperature, and then uh, um, uh, promotion and ad adoption of appropriate behavior, as you can see, forty-two percent. Be, uh, the beneficiaries were able to come back and then 42 again uh, around 42 to 43 percent came to reduce um or get get rid of the symptoms and finally uh 95 percent evaluated the impact of the cooling centers as positive that's here is what i wanted us to focus on we were asking ourselves, are the actions feasible? Is it possible to implement forecast-based financing uh, in, a, in a city setting? Hanoi has given us um, a go ahead. Basically, Hanoi, experience from Hanoi sh shows that yes, it is possible and it would reduce hazard impact, in this case, the heat. And then um, there is value for money uh, based on the on the on the on the on the post implementation evaluation as a result hanoi the hanoi experience has been uh, scaled up to six more cities within hanoi has it worked somewhere else i think this answer is yes does it raise many questions i think it is a yes also and that's where i pause to hear your questions Yeah, it's your turn, it's your turn, it's your turn to talk. What questions does this case study and the uh, previous 
um, presentation about the mechanism trigger in your mind. Raldo, does that answer your question? Oh, uh, sorry, that was actually, um, that was Rashik. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, it was nice meeting you, Megan. And yeah. Hey. Yes, please. Um, um, just out of interest, like, uh, so because there are indicators and, um, Kind of the finance has been built up um in cities in in africa like do we have a problem with that money being redirected to other um non-disaster related things when the when the triggers aren't hit i don't know if you have any experience with that thank you very much lauren for that question redirected to other non-disaster related no because I think at the time of receiving the money, the terms and conditions are, it will be used when, um, when a, give, a given trigger is reached. And uh, after that, either it is kept for the next season, and which has been in most cases. So if it, the money is not used, then it is kept uh, for the upcoming season but it has not been um, used for um, maybe development. The, in some cases, for example, when COVID hit, I think there was a, a flexibility to use the money that was supposed to um, be used for flooding to attend to COVID, uh, but that was based on, on a, a discussion with a donor. Um, and are there also issues around, like, for example, if the trigger hasn't been hit in, like, uh, in the annual cycle or in a three-year cycle, where funding has to be almost returned to the to the um, funder, or um, or do we readjust the um, the targets, or is the money redirected to other disasters that might have come up because you know the climate has shifted or something like that? Thank you. Thank you very much for also that wonderful question. Dorothy, would you like to say something about that? I see you're back. I'm glad to have you. Sorry, Eddie. Um, hi, everyone. Could you repeat the question just really quickly? I didn't catch the last end. I think the Wi-Fi cut off. No problem. Um, so, yeah, just curious to know, um, so once the funding has been secured and if your um, you know, the climate ships and basically uh, we don't reach the targets and the money doesn't get spent. Is there like ever a demand from the donor side for the money to be returned or is the money redirected to um, other disasters or risks that have come up? Uh, that kind of thing? Um, honestly, I'm not actually sure. I don't think, oh, Eddie, you might be better placed for this. I'm not actually sure, Lauren, so sorry. I think that generally the money has to be used for for whatever the activity was planned on being. Um, I know that there is sometimes an idea of like having the money, like, sorry, the money sent out and then if the trigger is not reached has to be sent back. Um, I know we do that with the imminent draft um, has happened a couple of times, I think, but I, I wouldn't be able to tell you, Lauren, I'm not sure. I would say though, it would probably be case by case basis depending on the organization. I'm sure the Red Cross has a has a system um, which may be different from from others as well. So yeah. I just want to answer your question. Yeah, and I think uh, so the 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 focus based financing approach I could it has it started somewhere maybe okay my first experience Hi everyone, uh, it seems we've lost Eddie. Um, hopefully he'll be back with us shortly.
Yeah, he's been to be frozen for me as well. Um, I won't try to predict what he was trying to say, um, but um, but I think that we could. Um, I think about your question about funding. I think it will be dependent on the individual donors and the um, and the individual systems that have been set up. So would encourage maybe to look into that more uh, more closely. I can I can try to find the answer for you as well. No problem. Um, and and just sort of interest. Have you have you had um, success with kind of involving city municipalities or local municipalities more in 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 these using this uh, focus based financing method, or is it still largely supported by like organisations like the Red Cross? I think for now it is very largely, um, or yeah, organization like the Red Cross itself. Um, but at, at kind of the core of the forecast based financing approach, um, and even in the, the ones that we have right now, is a, a need and a and both, a both a desire and a need to to integrate governments uh, at every stage of uh, of both like the design of the program and also the uh, the running of it. And so this is. This is part of the, the fundamentals of, uh, of forecast based finance in, in the way that we, we approach it. So um, there has well the, the case study that Eddie showed you in Hanoi is a good example where city officials are uh, have been um, you know part of the process throughout the whole yeah the, from from design to, to implementation. And I think this is yeah this is a um, I guess a, a fundamental goal of, of these types of programs is is to encourage. Um, the sustainability of them through through government systems as much as possible, uh, and so I think Eddie might have some examples of, of what's happening in, in Uganda right now. Um, but I think, yeah, oh, he's back. There we go, Eddie. Do you want to take my thanks? Come. Thank you, thank you. My internet went off, so I had to switch to another line. Um, yeah, I was just saying that uh, I. I, I, I am not aware of a time where they sent back the money. Um, in, in any case, they have been rolling it forward. Okay, um, and usually these projects have been going for yeah, they've been running three to five years. So if it doesn't happen one year, either it may happen in the second or in the third or in the fourth, uh, like that. Um, Raldo, over to. You. Thank you. Uh, apologies, I had to step out for another call earlier, so apologies if this has been covered previously. But just wanted to understand, um, I guess, what your definition is of um, these extreme events um, and, um, you know, how you take into consideration, I guess, climate change and increased frequency of extreme events, um, you know, and, and whether there's a criteria to allow funding to be dispersed if the if the event or the the effects of the event um is actually just the result of like poor long-term planning by the you know local municipality or, or government um as as opposed to a real kind of extreme weather event that maybe happens once every you know 10 or 15 years hope that makes Thank sense you. yeah Thank you very much. Uh, I'm enjoying the discussion. So, number one, um, we definitely put into consideration I, the, the the impact of of climate change. Indeed, that's the justification why we uh, we look at only extreme weather events. So they would be rare. Um, it's not your usual flash floods, you know, but it is. It is based on uh, uh, an in-depth analysis of the historical events um, or climate-related events that have happened. So we spend a lot of time doing the analysis. And, and this analysis brings together scientists, social scientists, and other practitioners within a, a country setting. Then after looking through the historical events then we say that you know we we said these particular events from the climate uh science point of view are extreme but then we also want to look at the impact you know if the the event was extreme then what was the impact 
again we see those events that caused high impact then we ask also ourselves why um is it because of just sheer vulnerability or was there um a challenge with uh, what governance issue anyway we rely on um in-depth analysis of the climate uh, related event in the past and then say and choose those that that had the most the most um, impact on the on the on the on the on the society or in the communities where we are going to work now so you ask what if it's just a challenge of governance um that created that that led to say a high impact event so it was the, from the climate perspective let's talk about the rain the rain was not that big but then the impact on the community was high because of governance challenges um, from uh, the leaders i think for that we do not use the forecast based financing but then we use other uh, humanitarian funding like the the the, the, the draft that my colleagues mentioned or the eminent drift that um that Dorothy mentioned yeah so that would be it 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 would be another kind of funding this particular one that we're talking about forecast based financing it deals with extreme weather events that lead uh, that has the potential to lead uh, to extreme uh, humanitarian consequences or challenges thank you i hope i answered but feel free to um yeah, tell me if there's something missing. And uh, Samantha, since you are here, and since I know you, of course, um, what what sort of gaps or challenges do you see with this kind of uh, approach? Um, and and if it is to be implemented in the city setting. Sure. Thanks, Eddie. And I must confess, I'm not um, an expert on cities. And I know some of my colleagues actually here today are actually working in the city. So um, I think I should steer clear <laughs> of saying anything for them specifically. What I can speak to a little bit is um, that I have been doing a fair amount of reading into the challenges that um, the municipalities here in South Africa um, are faced with in, in um, being able to, it's, it's one thing to access the money, but also in being able to absorb the money, you know, having the capability to be able to spend it meeting the conditions and the ways that the funders want you to work um so perhaps so there was a, a very interesting study done and it was actually talking to the the challenges um it was done by one world uh, interviewing um municipal officials here um so i don't know i think i would prefer to ask maybe lauren um or one of the others just from a a city perspective um kind of a more personal experience, whether it, it corresponds or slow me. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Sam. Nice to see you again. See you. All right. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I think the idea was this is an approach. And if you just Google it, if you just check out these lots of now publication about forecast-based financing, or even anticipatory uh, actions. Um, I think recently the, 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 the wording has been changed, or the naming, the nomenclature, trying to move away from forecast-based financing or forecast-based actions to anticipatory uh, actions. There's lots of research that has been conducted. Most of it you'll see is rural forecast. And for me, it's as an urban enthusiast, I, I would like to, to get forecast-based financing into the urban space. And that's the reason why I had to pitch this particular session. 
and um, I I will continue to pitch this uh, in upcoming um, in upcoming um, uh, city focus sessions uh, to see that you know because the world is becoming urbanized and then this approach is also gaining quite a lot of traction i, I would like to prepare both the urban practitioners and the dr practitioners to implement this approach in in, in cities um and uh, now i'm looking at the chat to see what samantha is saying, say, thinking are there if there are efficiencies that could be gained by linking to the forecasting used by insurers yeah indeed i am aware of conversations that have already emerged related to forecast-based financing uh, and the insurance companies. Uh, in one of the conversations that I participated in, the insurance companies, I think, thought that this is more of a, okay, some are akin to start to, to, to exploring it, but others thought that it is almost a sure deal that they will spend on it. Um, and they were not uh, quite happy with that kind of arrangement. Mm -hmm. um, if I can just quickly jump in here, I think like supporting what Samantha has suggested, um, from my experience, um, it's quite, we, we struggle with um, condensing is maybe the wrong word, but working with local governments to uh, sell bankable projects in, in a sense. And, and when it comes to like forecasting and, and kind of predictions, because it's, there's so much uncertainty around that, um, there's a little bit of reluctance to kind of set aside money um, that potentially uh, won't get spent, um, especially in a system, you know, in kind of the South African context, there's a lot of uh, kind of KPAs and those like key performance indicators around budgets and spending when it comes to local governments. Um, and trying to move away from that is, is uh, like a structural, uh, institutional struggle and challenge that we need to tackle. But looking at other ways um, in which to like couple uh, financing to insurance or for example if the money isn't used is there a way to for the money to keep growing and then be redirected um, still for the use of the city in disasters but maybe in another way so like how that money is financed and, and and making it more like bankable in a sense I think is uh, a way forward and how we do that is kind of where we should kind of start that discussion. Okay, I was on mute. Yeah, yeah I understandably so. Um, um, understandably so. The, the the city is given also the limited resources. I don't think they'll be keen to easily put money on the side to wait for a a, a hazard or an extreme event to happen. But I think also in some cases. Uh, the law provides for the country in general to have some disaster risk funding. And I think me, the question I keep asking would be, are cities able to access that particular funding or what can we do to do that? And also related to what you've just said, Lauren, um, we have not been able to challenge cities to allocate part of their funding for their disaster risk financing. But I think I, 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 I get it from you and uh, I would like to have that conversation with the cities and hear what do they think. Um, and to what kind of amount would they be willing to put forward, if, if any. Um, yeah, but I think uh, I'm, 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 I'm keen to explore that. Have you had any cities. success um, where you are and with the cities you've worked with? Say that again? Have you had any success with the cities you have been working with um, in terms of getting mm -hmm. them to maybe even start the conversation around um, 
allocating money to disaster risk reduction? Yeah, no, we haven't. We haven't. We haven't even had a conversation with the cities to allocate money. The first conversation before we ask them to allocate money, the first conversation is: Do you even have a functional early warning system? Because that's where we start from. And if it is available, then the next thing is: What happens when the early warning indicates that you are expecting an extreme weather event or a a hazard is going to happen um, that I have a set of actions to implement then with what funding would you use um, to implement them that would be the next but so far the cities that number one as humanitarian organization because it's been the humanitarian organization championing this the default setting is usually to incline to the rural area I think because this perception is rural areas are more vulnerable to extreme weather events. With the new, with this new uh, forecast based financing, which also talked about, which brings in vulnerability and highest impact, I think there's a possibility if the indicators of vulnerability are well thought through, there's a possibility to take action in the, in the cities. And then because the need in the cities is usually high, I think there will be a possibility of saying, hey, the humanitarian funding that we have is not enough. And therefore, we need um, it to be supplemented by the city funding. And then that's when we'll even now be able to say, hey, can you allocate a certain percentage of your money, of, of, the, of your funding uh, to this recurring um uh extreme weather event so now not yet however i have just remembered in uh in hanoi the city has now expanding from moving from hanoi to the next to the next six uh cities the city authority uh said that they'll be committing a certain amount of money um, to supplement the humanitarian funding that exists. In Africa, we are still far from that. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks, Eddie. And yeah, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, because I am, I'm a facilitator, I also understand that the conversation starts when it starts, and the conversation also ends when it when it ends i think now is the right time to end the conversation unless any one of you has questions or questions and i can see that luther is wants to enter but yeah any questions that uh, do you have any question um at this moment Thea, Raldo, uh, many thanks. All right, thank you very much. Ludo, you're welcome. You've just come at the right time uh, when we are summing up the conversation, uh, but uh, very glad to have you here. And thank you, Sam and Raldo and Lauren and Thea, and even you, Ludo, for joining. Uh, it was nice uh, convening with you for this particular session. I look forward to engaging with you. Uh, Father, thank you very much and have a wonderful day.